Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Migration Studies webinar and discussion of the new report, Immigrants' Use of New York City Programs, Services, and Benefits, Examining the Impact of Fear and Other Barriers to Access. During this webinar, we're going to hear from the authors of the report, Daniela Alulema and Jacqueline Pavlon, as well as several New York City officials. Uh, we're going to hear from Commissioner Manuel Castro of the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Dr. Jonathan Jimenez, the Executive Director of NYC Care at Health and Hospitals, and Shoshana Smolin, the Director of Immigrant Eligibility and Access for the Office of Refugee and Immigrant Affairs at the NYC Department of Social Services. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to the moderator of today's webinar, CMS's Executive Director, Donald Kerwin. Thank you, Emma, and we're pleased that all of you could join us today to discuss this important study. The study is the product of really a massive mobilization of community resources, which our co-authors are going to discuss a bit. At the outset, however, let me thank just two people who were extremely important to the study from the outset. Professor Sally Finley of the Columbia Population Research Center played a vital role in helping to conceptualize this project, and she served on its advisory group as well. And Rachel Pine, Senior Program Officer of the Altman Foundation, not only financially supported the work, but provided very valuable input on the project's design. The report has a long acknowledgements page that thanks the members of the project's advisory group. I'm not gonna go over all the names now, as well as the researchers, community groups, and city agencies that made the report possible. Let me just provide a few words of introduction to the report. It's based on a study that ran from January, 2020 to October, 2021. And of course, a lot happened during that period of time. Our concern, main concern at the study's inception was with Trump era policies and anti-immigrant rhetoric that we felt would make immigrants fearful to use city benefits and services. And then we were particularly concerned about the public charge rule and immigration enforcement policies of the Trump administration. The study examined fear and other barriers to accessing services in three general areas, use of public benefits, use of health services, and access to law enforcement and the courts. We were also cognizant of the standard language and cultural issues that can impede participation of immigrants in their communities. On the other hand, we recognize that New York City has made extraordinary efforts to earn the trust of its immigrant communities and to encourage them to access its institutions, services, and benefits. The pandemic, of course, very, very much complicated the study, both its logistics and its areas of inquiry. We expanded the scope of the study to include questions on the impact of COVID-19. After Trump's defeat, there was an open question on whether the change in administration would affect immigrants' use of services and benefits. I think the co-authors will speak to many of these issues. Let me just say, um, kind of outline how the research went. It included semi-structured interviews with 75 immigrants across New York City, all five boroughs, and there were two focus groups as well. The research team also interviewed 16 social service providers from CBOs and New York City agencies, including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Human Resources Administration, or Department of Social Services, and eight healthcare providers and social workers from the city's public hospital system. Let me turn now to the report's co-authors, Daniela Alulema and Jacqueline Pavillon. Daniela served as the director of programs for the Center for Migration Studies and led this study from its inception. In mid-January, she left CMS to become project director for the CUNY Initiative on Immigration and Education. Jacqueline Pavillon is CMS's Deputy Director for the CUNY Initiative on, um, excuse me, and directs CMS's research portfolio. Jacqueline joined CMS full-time last summer, and jumped into this research project and others at that time. 
Daniela is going to speak on the report's findings and Jacqueline is gonna speak mostly on its recommendations. So let me turn the program over to them now and we will hear from our public officials after they speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Um, and thanks to everyone who, who, who is connected to, to this webinar. And to begin our presentation today, uh, we wanted to first acknowledge and thank the 84 immigrants who trusted us with their stories, their lived experiences, their fears and aspirations. Um, we also want to thank the 24 workers across the different city agencies uh, that share with us their experiences and concerns. And of course, we're incredibly thankful to all the community-based organizations and leaders that connected us to them. And of course, the knowledgeable advisory group and the amazing research team, which included mainly students from different CUNY schools um, who made all of this, uh, this study possible. So we began this project seeking to examine uh, how fear affects the ways that immigrants access services, programs, and benefits in New York City. And we know that New York is a welcoming city. It has enacted policies and implemented programs to integrate immigrant communities. Um, New York is home to 3 million people who were born outside the United States. And out of that number, almost half a million are undocumented. So actually I have a PowerPoint uh, presentation, which I think my colleague Melissa will be sharing shortly. Um, and we can move to the second slide, Melissa. Uh, thank you. Um, so as Dawn mentioned, uh, we developed a, meth a methodology based on three different sources of qualitative data. And um, the semi-structured interviews that we conducted with immigrants across the five boroughs, um, uh, the, the, final, the final sample of 70, uh, the final group of 75 immigrants included 59 who were women. Their ages range from 21 to 79 years of age. Their educational attainment was a roughly evenly distributed where 19 had less um, than um, high school education and 25 were college graduates and the rest were in between. We also had 24 who were naturalized citizens and 50 were non-citizens. The interviewees came from 30 different countries of origin and we conducted interviews in eight different languages based on the interviewees language of choice. Um, we supplemented these interviews with focus groups, and of course, to round out the picture, we interviewed social service and healthcare providers from local government agencies and community-based organizations who directly work with immigrants. And these sources led to a wealth of qualitative data that speaks to the fear and barriers that immigrants face. And as Don mentioned, the, the, the data was, um, we categorized it in three different uh, general areas, which I'm, I'm gonna be addressing shortly. And not surprisingly, uh, one central finding of the report, which kind of sets back, sets the overall backdrop to the study and the reality that immigrants across the country are living is that the anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies enacted by the Trump administration worsened the fear that is connected to the lack of legal status. And to add to that bleak picture, the COVID-19 pandemic not only increased the need for services and assistance for all New Yorkers, but also had a disproportionate impact on immigrant, black and brown communities. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just highlight some of the top line findings from the study. Um, and ha but highly recommend that you all peruse the, the report to learn about the testimonies um, uh, shared by our interviewees. So first, on the use of public benefits, uh, many immigrant interviewees expressed fears about using public benefits due to their immigration status. We found that this fear was even more present, of course, among the undocumented and those with shorter tenures in the United States. And one overwhelming source of fear was the expanded public charge rule developed by the Trump administration. And this became apparent in different ways. 12 out of the 16 service providers that we interviewed said that their clients had expressed fear and stopped using benefits due to the expanded public charge rule. We also found that the rule impacted even immigrant groups that were not who were not covered by, by, by the rule. For instance, we found that immigrants were reluctant to receive fee waivers from green cards and naturalization applications out of fear of the expanded uh, role. Uh, the change in the presidential administration has also had mixed impacts in the way that our interviewees use benefits. Um, some immigrant interviewees 
told us that they were feeling calmer or were more hopeful under the Biden administration. However, a few immigrants still expressed reservations about using public benefits despite the new federal administration. And through our interviews, we also found that the context and the location in which immigrants are asked to share sensitive information can be a strong determinant of their comfort level, level in sharing that information. So for instance, one city worker said that immigrants seem more comfortable sharing information in settings outside a government um, office. Uh, a social worker at a hospital, hospital also shared that her clients seem more hap seem happier to hear that they could apply for certain benefits online as it seemed less threatening than going in person to a government office. Now, if we go on to the next slide, um, on the use of public health services, the immigrants, uh, public health services, yes, uh, the immigrants we interviewed expressed less fear about going to hospitals that, than they did about visiting government offices or using public benefits due to their immigration status. However, there were other barriers that affected the way that immigrants use healthcare services. First, uh, fear caused by rumors um, or you know, uh, due to the presence of, um, in, of ICE in particular neighborhoods, prevented immigrants from using hospital services. In fact, one social uh, worker said that she witnessed a steep decline in visits when ICE activity or rumors about it circulated among immigrant communities um, in 2018. We also found uh, from healthcare workers that undocumented immigrants often let their ailments go untreated out of fear regarding their immigration status or out of fear of losing their jobs. And as a result, their conditions became emergencies. One healthcare worker, in fact, shared that she always tells her interns to be mindful that immigrant patients typically don't have paid sick days. So if they are sick, the interns need to make sure that the follow-up and outreach are appropriate and effective. Um, now, if we move on to the next slide, please. So the third section of the study looked at immigrants' access and concerns about law enforcement and engagement with courts. And the respondents' experience with uh, law enforcement were mixed, but a large majority of the immigrant interviewees, when we posed a hypothetical scenario to them, said that they would call the police when necessary. Some immigrants, however, were hesitant to report crimes because they, they are misinformed about their right to non-discrimination and believe that potentially contacting the police could put them in at risk of deportation. Also through our interviews, we found that crimes against, against immigrants um, and witnessed by immigrants go underreported due to language barriers and fear of misunderstandings. Um, when asked in, in a hypothetical scenario, uh, one respondent says she would not even try to call the police because of the language barrier. Others said that because their English was poor, they would only report crimes that no one else could report or that they were, or that, uh, or crimes that were very serious. So to close, um, I just, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to share with you an excerpt from an interview with a service provider who told us the story of one of her clients. And she told us um, that her client is an immigrant, her husband and her and her two uh, American citizen children. The husband died due to COVID. And when she applied for food stamps, she really didn't want to apply. She was under the impression that also her kids are going to be penalized and they're going to have to pay this back when they grow up. And because she doesn't have any status, she was afraid. If she wanted to apply, she could for the kids. And um, she mentioned to her that when the require, what the requirements were and with, when uh, this immigrant mom uh, tried to get a letter from her employer, she actually got fired. And she was just so devastated because she was already at her wit's end. Uh, the service provider called her and she said she, the, uh, the immigrant mom didn't wanna be bothered again. So she was just so frustrated and devastated. So she just uh, let it go. So that's one, just one of the stories uh, that we heard through this study. And with this, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Jacqueline, uh, who will speak on the recommendations. Thanks, Don and Daniela and everybody else for, for joining us today. Um, just this, this report outlines the uh, recommendations for, for city agencies, um, service providers, uh, uh, 
you know, the New York State Senate's different different agencies uh, that could benefit from the information in this report. But we do want to acknowledge first that the New York City in particular and New York State have gone kind of above and beyond federal requirements uh, that to make a welcoming um, city and community for immigrants. So uh, all of the information in here is supplementary to what's being done already. And I just want to commend the agencies um, for their work for their work in this area already. So the report offers um, recommendations in six general categories. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple uh, from each one or two from each category that can give you an idea of what's at the, in the last chapter of this report, but I encourage you to, to read the report for, for the other recommendations. So <clears throat> the first uh, slew of recommendations is on the provision of information. Uh, we, we found that city agencies uh, should, should continue to use flyers and print materials as their primary media. As immigrants who we interviewed generally reported, those were more trustworthy, for example, than uh, TV ads or uh, other online sources, with the exception of two being social media and WeChat and WhatsApp. Um, immigrants said while they saw social media, uh, information on social media from CBOs and city agencies, you know, they'd like to see more uh, directly onto immigrant specific WeChat and WhatsApp groups. And one uh, immigrant even recommended to have print flyers telling you how to get on those WeChat and WhatsApp groups. So uh, print materials were very useful and even more useful when partnering with uh, community-based organizations, which we know city agencies already do, but also through other institutions such as schools, religious institutions, um, e even you know the, the consulates or New York City health and hospital networks that were deemed very trustworthy by immigrants. And those partnerships have proven to be valuable in providing information. The second would be on, uh, the second category of recommendations is how to reduce language barriers. Um, the city already does a, a very good job at this. However, we still found issues uh, with immigrants who speak specific dialects not being able to connect with an interpreter of the same dialect, if, even if it's the same language. And we know the city does training on what to do when an interpreter and a, and a client can't understand each other. However, we found this to be specifically important as you know, certain immigrants were saying when they're trying to tell a backstory about why they need services or benefits, the nuances get lost if the translation isn't exact. And they, there was still concern about that. Another uh, recommendation, for example, is to provide more signage in other languages, especially at hospital networks, uh, such that people can, can immediately go to emergency as needed or registration uh, rather than just waiting till they get an interpretation line. The third set of recommendations was on how to uh, reduce barriers regarding education level and technological literacy and familiarity with government systems. Um, one example for, for a recommendation on this would be at health and hospital networks. Uh, some immigrants said they're not familiar with how to use my chart. And so we would recommend that uh, you know, the hospital staff see what is the preferred method of follow-up communication of immigrants who might not be familiar with technological services. Um, our fourth set of recommendations is on how to be flexible in service provision. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of benefits applications have moved online, and we found that to be quite helpful to have a hybrid in-person online application model, as some people may fear entering government offices or be busy due to work, while others, you know, there's the technological barrier. So we found that uh, that hybrid model that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic is something that could and should be continued. Um, the fifth category of recommendations is on, you know, how to uh, different training models. HRA and MOYA provide a lot of training for community-based organizations that are free, and community-based organizations were often saying they don't have the trainings they would like to learn about updates to policy changes or benefits applications or eligibility. Um, and so we would encourage different, uh, different community organizations, legal advocates to reach out and utilize the Action NYC network uh, uh, programs by MOYA and the Access HRA uh, trainings that are provided by HRA. 
Um, and then the final category of, um, of recommendations would be on how to minimize the, the negative impacts of immigration enforcement. Uh, the New York State Senate has already made it unlawful and restricted ar civil arrests at state courthouses without a judicial warrant in the Protect Our Courts Act. And while the DHS uh, Secretary Mayorkas in, 2000, uh, in October of 2021 uh, provided recommendations that uh, ICE officials shouldn't enter other protected areas like medical facilities, uh, public uh, places that provide essential services. Uh, we would encourage the New York State Senate to restrict it to those other protected areas in the same way it has done with courts. Uh, and also provide clear, we would encourage DHS, Department of Homeland Security to provide clear recommendations on what immigrants can do if they are uh, do encounter ICE officials at one of those areas that is intended to be protected. So there are accountability mechanisms in place. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Don and, and to our city officials. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Daniela and Jacqueline. So it's, I, I have to commend to everybody, the report is really kind of an extraordinary work and it's a long report, but there, but it, you know, it's got quotes, it's got statistics, it's got testimonies, it's got great recommendations. So, so please do read it. Um, we're delighted to have um, the new commissioner of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs with us today, commissioner Manuel Castro, who mayor Adams appointed earlier this month. And, but he's long been known and well-respected in our field. Commissioner, I wonder if you could speak about um, Moya's work, in, including its efforts, which I know are long-standing to combat some of the chilling impacts of the public charge rule, for example, and maybe speak more generally about Moya's engagement with the federal government on some of these issues as well. Yes, certainly. Thank you so much, uh, Donald. And um, first, firstly, I'd like to say that I'm honored to join my esteemed colleagues in city government here today. And I thank the Center for Migration Studies for the invitation to be part of this important seminar. And of course, um, I'd like to say my thank yous to Daniela and Jacqueline who have worked so much and so extensively on this report and for your recommendations. Uh, they have already made an impact, certainly on my work in thinking as I uh, on board and start uh, tackling these issues. Uh, for those of you who are, may not be familiar with me, my name is Manuel Castro, and it has been a real privilege to have been appointed by uh, Mayor Adams to lead and serve uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, which is the largest municipal agency dedicated uh, to the well being of immigrant communities. Uh, I was previously the executive director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, a worker center based in Queens, New York. And I certainly was, or we have been certainly been on the receiving end of uh, the services and the work of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the collaboration of those uh, on, on this panel here today. Uh, I grew up undocumented. I came here when I was five years old with uh, my mother and grew up in, in New York City as a dreamer. Uh, my parents continue to be undocumented. So I know firsthand the impact of the work of uh, community-based organizations, advocates, and city agencies in making sure city government uh, and protections are in place for uh, immigrant communities and families like mine. Uh, since the early days as an activist, as a dreamer, and then as a community organizer, I've made uh, my mission to make New York City a place where immigrant communities can live in dignity and justice. And that certainly continues to be my mission as the Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, now, like I said, Moya, just so you're familiar, uh, Moya is the largest municipal immigrant affairs agency in the country advocating for immigrants, not just at the local, but also at the state and federal level. Uh, and through collaborative partnerships with other city agencies, who you'll hear about to, from today, elected officials, community leaders and organizations and more, uh, we've led, supported and managed a range of programs that increase justice, equity and empowerment for the city's immigrant community. So, the, the approach is two-pronged. We work outwardly to maintain relationships and trust with constituent members 
at the very local level in culturally and linguistically responsive ways. So we work with, as was mentioned earlier, with a large number of community-based organizations, both mainstream well-known coalitions, larger organizations, and also very small, you know, perhaps newer organizations that our neighborhood organizers identify and cultivate relationships with, and inwardly to educate and inform, and this is a very critical part of our work, other city agencies' abilities to serve immigrant New, Yorker, immigrant New Yorkers effectively. And so much of our work is focused on these two approaches. Uh, some of the ways we do this uh, is by implementing uh, ways to connect with immigrant communities. As I mentioned, we have uh, neighborhood organizers, which is you know, an innovation that was implemented here in New York, and now it's being replicated in other parts of the country. Uh, like I said, we advocate at all levels of government for in immigrant inclusive laws. So for instance, we're part of a coalition of cities across the country called Cities for Citizenship. And often New York is a leader in coming up with ways to integrate and advocate for immigrant communities, such as the most recent uh, law, uh, the non-citizen voting law uh, that introduced and passed last year and we hope to implement this year, and by delivering culturally sound services, including immigration services, immigration legal services, uh, and information on uh, the variety of city resources available to all immigrants. I'd like to point uh, to Action NYC, which is a robust collaborative uh, in partnership between the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and uh, local community-based organizations that are able to provide uh, legal immigration services uh, to the immigrant community. The city in Moya has worked very hard to earn the trust of uh, between local government and immigrant communities. And uh, that continues to be a priority for myself, partnering with community organizations, ensuring language access and implementing laws and policies that limit our cooperation with NICE, with ICE, sorry. Moya and our sister agencies have been, have made tremendous efforts to combat the chilling effect of the Trump administration's public charge rule. So for instance, the city sued the Trump administration, successfully halting the rule multiple times as lit litigation proceeded. Uh, and we also launched a multilingual ad campaign to reassure New Yorkers they can get care they need, whether it's emergency assistance, COVID vaccination, and more, without fear of immigration. We also created a robust set of trainings for city staff and outreach for material to inform frontline staff and the public of the status of the rule and its potential impacts. And we made sure that concerned New Yorkers to get legal help they need through, uh, as I said, our Action NYC collaborative and hotline. But as the report mentioned, we know that more can be done. Uh, we know that although the rule has been rescinded, it continues to be a dark uh, reminder of what can happen uh, against our immigrant communities. So we have seen this firsthand. Uh, the Moya, Moya's team on the ground, as I mentioned, our outreach and community organizing staff has seen this firsthand in their work at the community level. That access to benefits is still challenging for many immigrant New Yorkers, whether it is due to unfair immigration status restrictions, language access, the digital divide, or other systemic barriers that prevent immigrant New Yorkers from getting the help they need. We saw how undocumented immigrants, many of whom were on the front lines, keeping our city running throughout the darkest day of the pandemic, were cut out from essentially any federal COVID relief. So we know that the fight is not, not over. At Moya, we continue to do the following. Innovative and, and innovate and advocate to make city services accessible, accessible to all move from language access to language justice, and keep in place policies that make our city safer for all. And we continue, and this is very critical, to call on our federal government 
to, to, to step up and help us combat the chilling effects with clear and reassuring guidance on public charge. And we ask them to put forward a new rule that does not, that does not penalize immigrants for accessing public benefits. And of course, the fight for comprehensive immigration reform uh, that provides dignity and stability for immigrants is not over and we will continue to fight on until we achieve these essential reforms for our communities. No one in our city should be afraid to get the help they need, especially now as we reco recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, like I said, we will continue to work with leaders on the ground with community-based organizations, and as proposed by the report and by the team, with an expansive set of partners who work directly with the immigrant community, will continue to champion changes to positively impact our communities at all levels of government and ensure New Yorkers are empowered to seek care they need without fear. And so I leave you with that, and I wanna thank everyone who worked on the report, everyone who is participating on this panel today, and everyone who's joining us uh, to follow along in this very important moment for immigrant communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're, of course, huge fans of the work that Moya does on so many levels. And thank you for outlining that for us. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Jonathan Jimenez, who's the Executive Director of NYC Care, Health and Hospitals. And um, Dr. Jimenez, we'd like you to speak on, I guess, some of the findings and recommendations outlined by Daniela and Jacqueline. We heard from Daniela that um, immigrants aren't fearful per se of going to New York hospitals, but there are issues um, related to them delaying care them being fearful of going to appointments or hospitals when they feel that there's the possibility of enforcement nearby, interpretation issues, misinformation issues. And, um, and I, I was particularly taken with, Dan, um, with Jacqueline's recommendation from the report on you know, city agencies screening immigrants for technological literacy and following up with them on their preferred methods of communication, which seemed to me to be very a very smart uh, recommendation. So if you could um, if you could take over at this point, we'd appreciate it and we thank you for being with us. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, thank you all for having me. And uh, thank you, Daniela and Jacqueline for uh, a wonderful report. Um, in turn, there's so many things to be said. Obviously, New York City Health and Hospitals, um, the largest public health care system uh, in the city, really, you know, focused on um, serving immigrants in New York City. Um, you know, I, that's why I came to work for New York City Health and Hospitals. I was born at Elmhurst Hospital myself. Um, and it was a great, uh, important place, safe place to seek care, affordable place to seek care uh, when my uh, parents and, and aunts and uncles arrived to New York City. Um, and we've certainly improved over the years, as I think we came through in the report as well, uh, specifically with language access. Um, you know, we have telephone interpretation available at all. Uh, all our staff have it at hand with 200, over 200 languages. Uh, but I, I love the, the focus on, on health equity and making sure that rare dialects, uh, we, we make sure that our vendors and our partners provide access to, to that language interpretation as well. So I'm really interested in making sure to follow through on those recommendations specifically. So I agree with the commissioner that your, your recommendations are already uh, making a difference. Um, and with respect to telehealth, I think you know that is one of the greatest things that's come from the pandemic, right? Um, that there was such a rapid change to making sure we could do many things um, electronically. And there are many benefits to that. As a physician, I still I see patients sometimes that are, you know, literally, and you know, for for better or for worse, um, within their the structure of their job are now able to see me more regularly because they're able to take a step away from um, whatever job they have and see me in the corner. But we know there are, there are barriers to people who maybe don't have the, the digital literacy there. And so we, we did 
acquire grant funding recently for uh, telehealth navigators. We have two at the moment full time, uh, one at Bellevue and one at Metropolitan, but we hope that that's a program that expands. Uh, but the idea there is that we would not just be making tele, you know, telephone appointments and te video appointments um, without following up with that person to make sure they know how to use it on their specific device and that they're comfortable accessing language inter interpretation as well. Um, so that's a growing um, effort. My chart is also the main way that uh, our patients, which uh, it's about you know a million unique patients a year that we see, um, that access their health record, they can see everything essentially. But initially it was only available in English. Now it's available in Spanish and we're hoping to translate it into um, all 13 languages, which are the sort of the most common languages that we see and we translate all our uh, communication into those languages. Um, another recommendation, which I thought was really, um, really important is the signage one. Uh, certainly places like Elmhurst have, you know, almost all of the signage in uh, 13 languages, uh, but that I don't think that's true across our system. So that's uh, an area of improvement. Um, with respect to safety, and, and this is related to language access too, I think there's, there is a, a, a role for uh, staff training, which I think you also brought in your um, recommendations, uh, which I loved. And I, I started to do some of that work when the NYC care program launched, but I say that the focus on staff, uh, because you know, fear is really, really difficult to, to stamp out. And I think part of the task of, of us as city agencies who are welcoming of immigrants and um, really enjoy taking care of our immigrant New Yorkers um, is to make sure that that's apparent on every staff member, the way they interact when they encounter a language barrier, um, people who you know, may be different from their own experience or may have a different experience. And so part of that is making sure what that each staff member knows the rights and the benefits that are accessible to them, like the telephone uh, uh, language line, like NYC Care, um, like medical legal part partnership as well, um, which we're also, as New York City Health and Hospitals, we're proud to, to be, uh, I think, one of the largest in the country that, uh, that started at Elmhurst as well, uh, where at every uh, facility we're able to offer access to, uh, to lawyers who can help with any legal matters. Of course, immigration, um, legal issues being the most salient, but often uh, also just uh, making sure we're uh, avoiding eviction, um, accessing benefits appropriately. Um, and, you know, there's so there's so much more I could say about um, applications and COVID-19, uh, but I don't, I, one thing before we move on to questions, and we could go on for, for a long time and excited to actually see some of the questions, is the application piece. Um, for NYC Care in particular, which, you know, I, I don't know how many in the audience will be familiar specifically, but, you know, it's a program that was launched in August 2019. I'm the executive director of the program at the moment. Um, really proud to be a part of the program, but essentially created an insurance-like product um, that provided a sort of open door, a uh, welcoming door to immigrants in New York and anyone who finds the insurance they're eligible for unaffordable. Um, and one of the first things we did was make sure that the application process was available online. And so that's one of the good things that came from, um, from the pandemic. It really fast tracked some of the, the processes to make sure they were electronic. Um, that and, and what we've seen through that program, I'll also share, is that there is a huge demand, uh, not unsurprisingly, I think, from, from uh, New, York, New Yorkers. We have started at around 10,000 members when we first launched and have quickly uh, are close to crossing the 100,000 member active member line. And we're, we expect that we'll be much farther than that. And we improved access for pharma, for medications for those patients, and many are seeing improvements in their chronic disease control, hypertension, diabetes included. Um, and so we're, I think over the coming year, where these recommendations are really crucial because we're looking for what else, what is it that that, that is keeping the other 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 maybe um, that aren't 
uh, enrolling and maybe are afraid to enroll, what, how can we make sure that we have that welcoming door open and that people have good experiences when they come see us and tell their friends, you know, like any uh, product that's the word of mouth is especially important in immigrant communities, but really important with healthcare as well. And I know that's how I get a lot of patients <laughs> any, uh, specifically, so. Um, I'll pause there um, and and looking forward to questions and any follow-up questions from the audience as well. We'll go now to Shoshana Smolin, who's the Director of Immigrant Eligibility and Access for the Office of Refugee and Immigrant Affairs of the New York City Department of Social Services. First of all, thank you for being with us today and for your agency's participation in this study. Um, I guess from your institutional vantage point, we're, we're interested in knowing what particular steps you think can be taken to ensure that immigrants can access services and benefits. You've listened to some of the conversation, but I'm sure you have lots of ideas yourself. And also, um, we haven't talked about COVID very much, but I, I wonder if you would speak a bit on how COVID has complicated issues on, here on, on, on access to services, benefits, and institutions. Absolutely. And thank you. I'd like to echo the uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you so much for having us and giving us all the opportunity to speak about the report and the findings and to share some of the um, programs and um, access points available to the community that this, uh, this report really seeks to serve. Um, before I really dive in, I'm just going to explain a few acronyms that I'll use frequently uh, to avoid any confusion. I know many who are familiar with government and bureaucracy know that acronyms abound. Um, so the uh, main ones that you'll hear from me are the Department of Social Services is DSS, uh, the Human Resources Administration, HRA, DHS, the Department of Homeless Services, and like many of us have mentioned, CBOs are community-based organizations. Um, we're very familiar with shorthand, so we use it frequently. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge, uh, Jacqueline, a lot of what you said in the beginning about the focus New York City really puts on welcoming immigrants into the city and doing everything we can to really recognize the specific challenges that immigrants face when navigating benefit systems. And certainly DSS seeks to address those obstacles uh, and minimize them so that folks who really need the benefits that we provide are able to access them. This is definitely an ongoing conversation that we have when we get wind of things that come up that we may not have known before or things that may not have previously been major obstacles that have risen. So it's something that we speak about frequently and it's never really on the back burner. We also really recognize that COVID-19 has played a particularly difficult part in the lives of many immigrant community members and made some of the obstacles that they already faced in accessing benefits even greater. Um, we want to make sure that it's known for everyone that HRA across the board always encourages anyone to apply for benefits regardless of any immigration status. All are welcome and encouraged to apply for benefits so that when those applications come in, from that point on, we're able to make benefits determinations that people may have already think, thought that they are excluded from, but in reality, they may be eligible. So we really want to encourage that. Um, one of the main things that we put a strong emphasis on is outreach efforts to folks in the city. Um, many know of HRA and DSS and DHS and the things that we offer, but to many who don't, we're a mystery. So we have put together immigrant-focused marketing on benefits and created a comprehensive guide on which benefits immigrants may be eligible for. I just want to make a very important note that um, any person who applies, immigrant citizen, anywhere in between, their benefits eligibility determination is made on an individual basis. So we often get requests for information that gives details on what large swaths of the population may be eligible for. And we really 
really try to avoid that because we make those determinations one by one based on a totality of circumstances and everything that a person includes. So we never want someone to feel that by reading a flyer that gives generalities that they are excluded from applying for something or may be ineligible for something that their particular circumstances may actually make them eligible for. Um, HRA always keeps immigrant populations in mind with our media outreach. All HRA advertising campaigns contain newspaper ads. I know print ads were a major part of the recommendations. Um, we place those in community and ethnic newspapers, radio stations in many languages, um, transit ads and bus shelters, um, specifically targeted to neighborhoods that we know that have a large immigrant population. And we try to place materials with CBOs and elected officials as well. Um, this is something that we're always looking to expand and make sure that it's as widespread as possible. Prior to COVID-19, uh, DSS outreach workers would hold office hours in community locations where they were able to assist people one-on-one -on -one with direct enrollment and benefits um, and many other questions they may have. Of course, we've run into some difficulty with holding those kinds of office hours due to the pandemic. But what we have done in the interim is during warmer months, we do hold outdoor enrollment events, something that we're looking to continue when it starts to warm up again, uh, as well as doing some virtual programming. We also have very strong outreach that we conduct with partners. We have our team that works closely with a number of different CBOs specifically serving immigrant communities, um, as well as community locations that uh, provide on-site services. We work with a network of community-based organizations that offer that direct help with applying for benefits um, and recertifications, and a list of partners that offer those services is available on our website. I can include it in the chat as well. And by calling 311 and asking for help with applying for benefits. Um, since the pandemic, something that we have added to our DSS communications is a weekly call that the commissioner of DSS holds with community partners and elected officials, where he provides updates on different uh, agency programs and opportunities and participants in that call have an opportunity to ask questions directly of the commissioner and receive those answers. Um, and after each of those calls, there's a written communication that provides updates, not just on things within our agency, but with any sort of relevant programming that may apply to uh, to the community, including, of course, those that focus on immigrants and non-citizens. Um, so those bulletins reach about 6,000 community partners each week and continue to go out on a weekly basis. And if you are interested in receiving that, definitely feel free to reach out. There's information about that on our website. Um, while we do have, like I said, limited in-person engagements, we do offer our our staff at uh, virtual events and programming that are taking place. We've participated in many panels and forums that happen virtually, and we are conducting virtual trainings. Those still happen very frequently on Access HRA, our online, pro, um, our online platform where people can apply for benefits and other different kinds of aspects to our benefits. The other element that I wanted to touch on is also the different language access features that our agency has incorporated. We are we have uh, identified 102 unique languages that our HRA clients have indicated as their preferred language. And so that's just under 30% of households that the agency serves that have a preferred language that is not English. Um, all agency staff have telephonic interpretation services available to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is provided by Language Line Solutions. They are professional interpreters and uh, calls are answered incredibly quickly. We've made use of those services uh, just shy of 300,000 times in 2020 on an average of 1,075 times per workday. Um, and all agency walk-in locations have a poster in 19 different language 
languages that advertises free confidential language services and what to do if clients feel that they haven't received appropriate language services. Um, we also do our best to make sure that any of our notices and um, communications use the simplest language possible so that even when there is the need for legally precise language, we really do our best to make sure that the information is understandable and digestible in whatever language it may be. We also make sure that staff are trained in what to do in situations. I know that were mentioned in the uh, in the report where there's a uh, an interpreter and it seems there may not be an understanding between the staff and um, the interpreter and the client. There, we do include information on that in our limited English proficiency training, um, which in 2021 was converted into an e-learning course um, and over 35,000 staff members were trained uh, since its launch in December of 2021. Um, last thing I'll touch on is just that we have uh, two other trainings. We have an anti-bias training and we offer a non-citizen eligibility training for SNAP uh, and cash assistance. Basically, we want to do our best to make sure our staff members are equipped to handle any situation that may arise with immigrants seeking benefits. And when in doubt, they can always give our office a call and we try and assist with any of those situations that arise. So apologies for speaking quickly. I just had a lot of things I wanted to share and look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. And we do have some questions and some time for questions now. Let me start with this one. Um, commendations on this excellent research and your important recommendations, which address ways to go forward in New York City and state. Severe bars and fears were instilled in 1996 in the Welfare Act and the Immigration Reform Legislation. The Attorney General clarified exemptions to the bars in 2001, but the federal government has not issued policy guidance since then. Um, what can be done to update and clarify federal policies so as to access, so access to public benefits can occur, especially for those without status? Anybody want to? Yeah, I'll, I can jump in and then anybody else can comment as well. Um, regarding the bars, um, in the appendix of the report, there are kind of charts showing which immigrant groups would be eligible and which are facing bars um, for different federal, but also New York State and New York City benefits. So um, I would just say where, uh, where immigrants are not eligible for certain benefits, they might be for state or city benefits. And so you can see in, in some of those tables that where, for example, immigrants might be exempt, for, uh, they might not be eligible for certain federal programs, there might be city or state programs that cover them. Regarding how to, to clarify those policies, um, that is what uh, one of the recommendations I was mentioning about training. Uh, lots of CBOs and legal advocates kind of expressed that they didn't feel they were always up to date on rapidly changing policies um, and who is, who is eligible for what. Um, I think with, with that, you know, we do recommend number one that city agencies uh, make mandatory trainings that with le with you know trained and certified lawyers who are familiar with immigration policy such that they can you know get updated as things are happening in live time and secondarily for those city agencies that do provide those free trainings um, such as trans on how to use access hra or uh, moya's uh, action nyc lines i would say you know, CBO should take advantage of those free training such that they can stay stay up to date as quickly as possible uh, to know, to, to be able to clarify who is eligible for what. Jacqueline, you, you took some of the words right out of my mouth. I was just going to mention that while there are some federal barriers that are a bit harder to break down, while some folks may not be eligible for certain federal benefits, there are state benefits that they may be eligible for and that whenever there are changes in eligibility at whatever level, we definitely do our best to try to make those known. Um, some of the more recent eligibility changes that have happened have been um, some state benefits eligibility for individuals who are in the applicant status for asylum, meaning they've submitted applications but have a work authorization. Uh, and um, 
the most recent one for SIG, the Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. Uh, those are changes that we have definitely blasted out to everyone as much as we can, um, but always looking for more. I think this question might go to the immigration laws as well. And the, and the bar being that um, people who are undocumented have to leave the country to um, consular process. And when they're outside the country, then they're then subject to bars on return based on their unlawful presence in the United States. And there's a, there's a way to seek before the before they leave um, a waiver to that bar, but it's, it's, that's a difficult process. And um, I think that the reference to 2001 might be that um, they allowed certain persons based on when their petition was filed to adjust in the United States and not have to go abroad to consular process. And that is true that that, that should be extended uh, to additional categories of people. So people that were undocumented that qualify for visas aren't then years later, um, not able to secure the visas or not return to the country after they've consular processed. So that, that's another kind of bar to keep in mind. Another one says, and this is interesting in regards to the public charge rule statute, the affidavit of support form I-864 is a safety net which protects the government as well as the beneficiary to utilize public benefits and funding. What I think is the city should be using and arguing when litigating is, uh, is to make it easier where beneficiaries can respond to agencies on this matter. I'm not, I'm not totally sure of that point. Um, I mean, I guess one thing I would say is that with the affidavit of support, there's a, there's a real question as to why you need to change the public charge rule at all, since the affidavit of support are, already requires sponsors to, to maintain people that they're sponsoring in a certain level of income. And it's so it's kind of, it was always redundant and kind of punitive for that reason that, that they were trying to make the public charge rule uh, stricter. The, um, another comment, this is uh, somewhat of a limited study in the sense that uh, it's interview based, although that's not entirely true, but there's a large research background showing that these sentiments are widespread. Where do you see yourselves contributing the most to uh, research on the chilling effect of immigration enforcement efforts? Um, I can start this question and then anyone, if, uh, or Jacqueline, if you'd like to jump in. Um, so um, the study, the, this particular study um, was conceptualized before the COVID-19 pandemic started. So um, I think a, we we were given an opportunity to understand you know the additional hurdles that immigrant communities had to face given this public health emergency. Um, so it it added another lens of complexity um, to to the study and also showed and, and I think this has been documented as well in different um, through different reports and in different senses um, the, the the struggles that immigrant and, and minority communities. Um, have to face uh, because of the, the, the pandemic. Um, and, all, and the study also coincided with the transition between two administrations. And I think a, it, the, this report documents the legacy and the after effect that an anti-immigrant uh, administration can have in immigrant communities. And even after, even, um, after a change in, in, in administration, we were still finding uh, fear uh, and misinformation in, in among immigrants. So I think there's um, there's still a lot of work ahead of us and, and it, it will take, I think, a long time to regain the trust um, that immigrants lost. Um, and in, in totally, I, I understand why, um, but it definitely, I, I think that the report uh, or this particular study um, was, it happened in, in a time where um, our society was facing um, two, two uh, very difficult crises, so. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, as Don said, it, it's not necessarily limited because it's qualitative. You know, CMS does a lot of quantitative and, and qualitative and mixed method research, um, but all of it is done, you know, with rigor in the sense that the interviews are coded um, according to themes and you know we we did 
try to have people from all all different boroughs, all different nationalities, language, and etc. So I, I do think um, the findings uh, are, are not necessarily limited uh, in the sense that they're not quantitative. Um, but I just wanted to echo Daniela in saying that, um, you know, be, especially because of the pandemic and the change of administration, it, it is an added level of, level of complexity. And also, you know, we were able to find that the pol kind of the stickiness of those, the impacts of those policies in the sense that they, they persist over time. And I, I think this quote, um, it's in the executive summary, but also, you know, from also in the main report, um, one, one uh, immigrant explained, yes, I'm aware of the public, the public charge act has been rescinded by the Biden administration, but people still think it's not safe. People will tell you, yes, but you never know when the rule could come back. They say they don't want to jeopardize their chances of bringing their children, so they want to focus on the bigger picture as opposed to just some money. And I think th the timing of this report has been particularly interesting. Also, the fact that it's centered in New York City, which is already offering these services. However, as you know, we mentioned more more can be done on top of that. And um, as Commiss Commissioner Castro has said, that that you know their agency is uh, you know hearing some of the recommendations and already and, and Dr. Jimenez as well. So um, I just wanna say that the timing and the fact that it's in New, in New York City, yeah. We have a question I think for the public officials, which is um, what to do in cities and states that don't have policies that are as, um, as progressive as New York's and what would you prioritize if you were in Arizona or Wyoming, for example? What would have the most effect? I can start as well, and Daniela, feel free to add. Um, but I, I think that you know New York City has a political climate that allows it to pass state and city rules that are on top of uh, federal rules. They provide additional services. Um, however, there are other barriers, you know, that uh, political climate aside um, kind of persist across immigrant communities and a major one that many people said was a, one of the main obstacles um, was language. And I don't think, you know, providing information in other languages or upping translation services is a politically, as politically charged as perhaps, you know, extending benefits to other immigrant groups. While I think that New York City should be a model and on top of on top of that, you know, improving it with some of the recommendations in this report, I think that that's a place to start if you were to start with one, you know, just improving language equity and access and um, and just, it's as simple as, as that for some some communities um, and, and then, you know, extend it from there. But I think that that might be less controversial and it's one of the Kind of biggest bang for buck if you're going to do something good it's going to get a a, a great impact yeah yes commissioner uh thank you donald uh yes just to echo what jacqueline said speaking from the experience of uh, an advocate i had i had been an advocate for a long time and was um organizing and campaigning for many of the things that are now implemented at Moya in at the city, one of the one of the things that should be considered if they aren't already in place in other in other states and cities is the creation of an office of immigrant affairs. That is incredibly important because it allocates resources uh, to working directly with communities. That was certainly important in the creation of uh, this office, this agency, uh, and then, you know, you grow from there. Also, uh, you know, in addition to language access and, you know, um, making sure city or municipal services are available in, in other languages, something like the municipal ID is incredibly important because without an ID, immigrants are, have a really hard time navigating uh, you know, their cities and states, if, if you know, the states don't have something like a driver's license, uh, you know, that, that uh, immigrants can access. So I would start there. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, uh, yeah, also to echo, I think there are lots of things we can do programmatically uh, to the point about um, language access. I think digital literacy is also sort of a parallel there. Um, there are many things that we can do to sort of, uh, 
improve access for uh, vulnerable populations generally are marginalized uh, that will improve access and benefits for um, uh, immigrants. And I think many of these are within our control in whatever institution you're in. Uh, and I'll actually share with the audience, um, at least within healthcare, there was an interesting report that we've been looking at closely um, by some scholars in Boston delineating what different healthcare organizations were doing to be most welcoming uh, to immigrants and you're, know, you're fading out there a little bit, Dr. Hamid. Sorry, there, there are lots of good recommendations. So I'll place a link in, link in the chat in case there's something there for, for the audience. Okay, we have a Shoshona, we have a question for you. You mentioned that CBO collaboration is key to getting information to immigrant populations who speak languages other than English is their primary language. However, many CBOs are overwhelmed and not able to meet the need with the funding they have. What are what is DSS doing to push for greater funding to these groups and or expanding funding to other groups to help meet the need? This is definitely something that we are no strangers to, both from the hearing it from the partners that we work with and personally from a background as uh, working in CBOs previously. Um, I think that the unfortunate truth is that many times we find ourselves to be very stretched. Um, what we at DSS try our best to do is to basically capitalize on what everyone can bring to the table. We at DSS are the ones who are providing the benefits, and we want to make sure that the information about that is spread as much as possible. So sometimes when CBOs don't have enough resources of their own, CBOs are able to order materials from DSS in any language that they that um, we have them in and we have our materials available in many, many different languages. Um, they can contact us and basically receive whatever materials that we have available so that they can distribute those rather than having to either explain things themselves or hold meetings to explain things. Um, they can do that. We also try to make ourselves, like I mentioned, as available as possible for events with um, community members so that they can ask us directly about different elements of benefits programs and help to eliminate any questions that they may have, which would hopefully then ripple effect have less of a strain on those CBOs. So we try very much to take care of each other in the partnerships that we have so that basically everyone is doing the best that they can and using their resources to the best ability so that the community members are the ones benefiting. Thank you very much. I think we're pretty significantly over our time here. So I think um, we have a couple of more questions. Let me just read them very quickly. And if anybody can respond to them quickly, um, please do. And then we'll then we'll cut, cut away. One is what was the main criterion of selecting beneficiary respondents? Another was, are there best practices on change management when moving to a hybrid application model? Um, a third was, do you have um, recommendations on how to improve tri-agency guidance? And a fourth was the study confirmed how crimes against immigrants go underreported. Um, this is going to particularly affect human trafficking. Um, do you have any recommendations on this? I can start with the question on the criterion, the criteria that we use to select participants. Um, so essentially we work through community-based organizations across the five boroughs. Um, to locate immigrants who were willing to be interviewed for the project. And um, as long as the participant was over the age of 18, born outside the United States and lived in New York City, they could participate in the study. Um, and of course we offered, a, we partner, a, paired them up with a research assistant who spoke their language. Um, and we also use ACS data to um, come up with a breakdown based on nationality to make sure that we attempted at least to get a somewhat representative group of the immigrant population in New York City. Um, so according to that, we based our outreach uh, to CBOs to make sure that we, we obtained um, a diverse uh, group of, of participants. Um, I'll pass it on to others if they wanna address uh, the other questions. I can just speak very briefly to the um, transition to hybridization. Uh, it's something that while we were in the midst of having our centers shut down. There were definitely reallocations of staff to try to help meet the growing needs of the 
um, online and phone uh, services that we offer. So it's definitely something that we're still in the learning process of, but something that we have been adapting to as we've seen the needs shift. Okay, thank you very much. I think if there's no, if there's nothing else, I think we'll have to cut it off now. I want to thank the co-authors for a terrific report and to the CMS staff for their great work on this event, and particularly thank our public officials who for their partnership in this project and for their great comments and for being with us today, Commissioner Castro, Dr. Jimenez, and Director Smolens. Thank you all very much.